What's up, guys? It's KB. Make sure you subscribe to the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. Click the bell icon down below so you don't miss a single video from us. And thanks for tuning in to another video from Underground Sports Philadelphia. Now let's get into it. Philadelphia, baby. You're going to love it. Best sports fans in the world. Actually the worst, but that's what makes them the best. What's going on, everybody? It's KB and Stephen McAvoy here on Light the Flame, an Olympics podcast presented by Underground Sports Philadelphia and Shopify. And this is your Olympic recap episode for Wednesday, July 31st. Let's get into it. Steve, welcome to uh, Light the Flame for the very first time. It's good to be here. It's good to uh, chat. It's been fun watching the games. I don't like this is the first time in my life that I've been able to have a full time job and be able to watch it all at once. So it's like the monitors at work, and I shouldn't be saying this, but but now it's basically putting myself on blast. We have the one work screen, the laptop screen, and then the one screen that's solely Olympic coverage that everyone behind me can see very clearly. And everyone's like peeking over and watching as I'm watching like Katie Ledecky going, I'm like, gosh, go, go, go. Or like, uh, I was watching, uh, he was Hungarian. It was, uh, it was, I think it was a backstroke. I forgot what his name was. It was like, like Uber Koss, who, by the way, was filthy uh, in the backstroke. And I'm watching it and I'm making jokes. And my friends, my friends are like, Uber, Uber. And I'm like, oh my God, that's ridiculous. That's great. Uh, a lot went down today. It was a loaded slate of events here on day five of competition. Uh, but you already name dropped her, Steve. So I think the best way to start this episode is just talking about the goat in the water. And that is my president, my goat, Katie Ledecky, just doing I, it again in the 1500 meter freestyle. I don't think that it's uh, certainly isn't debatable at, at this point. And I mean, we can always talk about how Michael Phelps is the greatest Olympian of all time. But uh, there's no denying that at least in the female category, Katie Ledecky is the greatest American or possibly greatest swimmer ever. Uh, I can't tell you what the history looks like, but um, the only thing that I have to put towards that that I know is significant is that over the course of her entire Olympic career, in every single 1500 uh, meter freestyle that she's participated in, she has beaten the field in an average distance of 21 and a half seconds on average and holds the 20 fastest Olympic 1500 meter freestyle times. If that doesn't scream absolute epicness to anybody, I don't know what is. Uh, just absolutely freaking obscene. And to watch her, first of all, the concepts for those of you who don't like understand and like watch swimming enough, which to be honest with you, I don't. I know you were somewhere back in the day, but to to quantify fifteen hundred meters, to my I look own. at it. I look at it in track terms. Like I'm beat after I run four hundred meters. Uh, now imagine swimming. What is it? Thirty some some odd laps. Every back and forth is, is what a hundred. Uh, every back and forth is a 50. Yeah. All right. 50 so, meters one way, 50 meters the other. So tell me, tell me what the map 100. is on, on that. It's like 30 laps or possibly, or possibly double that. And an absolutely obscene number to be able to accomplish. Uh, so it's, I'm yeah, like, it I, is I, the I mile. Struck. It is, it is literally like the, uh, it's the death sentence, like event when you're growing <laughs> up and you're swimming, you know, just like thinking about swimming at 1500 like i used to do it every year for my summer club team for a charity that we did like everyone swam the 1500 and it was just like grueling Awful. like hardcore and to think that katie ledecky is this dominant and has the 20 fastest times in this event in olympic history plus no less set an olympic record today with oh, yeah. her time of a 1530.02 uh, 10 seconds better than the next finisher for her eighth career Olympic gold medal. She's now tied with swimming legends Jenny Thompson, Natalie Coughlin, relative of Tom Coughlin, uh, and Dara Torres for the most medals of all time, which is 12 by any U.S. woman in history. Who, by the way, had they had on Cough, Coughlin and Thompson on the broadcast watching her in the stands through the headphones on, and Mike Tirico was talking about it. And like they were like, look, I like, their sports were different. Like everyone, I was debating this the other day. I was talking about how, like, the how could you debate the greatness of like Simone Biles versus like Michael Phelps versus Katie Ledecky? Obviously, Ledecky and Phelps are a little more related, but you look at like, gymnastics and you look at swimming, and there's so many different events that you can do in swimming. And there's also, there's also so many different ones that you could do in gymnastics, it's obviously more in swimming. So, like, to quantify like, oh, eight gold medals in one year by Michael Phelps is a 
thing un, unto itself. But Simone Biles four years ago getting what a goal or eight, eight years ago getting gold in every single category. That's a whole other thing uh, unto itself. Plus the skill sets are, are different. There's no denying when you look at the female athletic prowess, these two women openly said Katie Ledecky is the greatest female athlete of all time. Yeah. Which is like, oh my God. It's insane. And when you have uh, the home nation of France, Anastasia Kerp, Kerpichnikova, uh, yep. saying in a quote, I was shocked uh, finishing second. I can't imagine that I am second right behind Ledecky is like that just shows you the greatness is like somebody being stunned that they are finishing in second place behind Katie Ledecky and just knowing that like outside of Katie Ledecky, you're the best at this Olympics. Like it's really cool. And and Katie Ledecky said, it's an honor to be named among, you know, those names that we listed off. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for them inspiring me. There are so many great swimmers that have helped me uh, to get to this moment. And it's awesome seeing, you know, Rowdy Gaines tweeting pictures of his monitors up in the broadcast booth yep. and just like a gazillion goat emojis uh, on the 40 year anniversary of when he medaled uh, in the hundred meter freestyle. So like for that recognition from one swimming legend to another as well, from way back when is really awesome. And, and we obviously know Michael Phelps is the biggest Katie Ledecky fan out oh, there. Yeah. Um, it's unreal to see just her dominance in this event earlier this week when she finished in third in the 400, everyone was like, Oh, she washed. It's like, no, that's, that's the little like midnight snack she goes in the pantry for and, and just enjoys that she can be, you know, that good in that event. Yeah. That's just her warm up. That's what she does as a warm up to this one. This is the big one. And she does it in style 20 fastest times in the 1500 meter freestyle just unreal and uh usa swimming tweeted the the blurred out goat image with uh the wiping of glasses next to it and then it's just a picture of katie ledecky so the the best tweet that i saw though was uh, was from michael jordan who said shout out to the girl who wouldn't even bat an eye when i tried play, playing peekaboo with her in the stands once there's a photo from like the late 90s where it's just michael jordan playing peekaboo with her in the seat in front and she commented back uh, couldn't take my eyes off the popcorn bucket. And I'm like, this is the funniest thing of all time, the banter here between two absolute legends. And, and, and again, like Michael Phelps being in the um, being in the booth with my Tariko, uh in the studio, being able to talk about it, I've never seen a bigger reaction from someone like him, aside from obviously winning his own, his own medals, aside from Katie Ledecky, than when he was cheering on for Leon Marchand, who was actually a, a mentor to him, uh, as he was developing his skill, the Frenchman, who also I've, I've been awestruck by his skill set uh, throughout the last three days. It's been crazy. Yeah, he's been insane. And I'll, I'll touch on just like his greatness in a moment. I do want to mention too, Isabella Ghost finished third in that 1500 meter uh, freestyle for Germany and the women's 100 meter freestyle, which if you like speed. 100 meter freestyle is for you in either event. Uh, Team USA's Tori Husk and Gretchen Walsh battled once again days after they both won medals in the 100 meter butterfly and the 4x100 meter freestyle relay. Uh, but Sweden Sarah uh, Sjoystrom, apologies for mm -hmm. the pronunciation, who claimed gold all while setting a world record in the process with a time of 52.16 seconds. Uh, Sarah is the greatest. I'm so happy for her, Huss said. Uh, she is such an accomplished swimmer, and she's so sweet and kind. It couldn't have gone to a nicer person. And then Siobhan Hawhey, Hawhey, uh from Hong Kong, I believe, uh, finished with the bronze and Tori Husk with the silver for the U.S. Um, but yeah, Leon Marshawn, Casey and I talked about it on yesterday's, yesterday's episode a little bit, too. He's being coached by Michael Phelps' coach. Like, he's getting the GOAT treatment, uh, and everyone's calling him the French Michael Phelps. Uh, you know, when he's been practicing in college, they've been doing sets that Michael Phelps did when he was training in his prime. And before the set even begins, Leon Marchand, uh, there's a story where he asks, what did Phelps go? And coach tells him he beats Phelps' time in that set by two seconds in practice. He is motivated to be the next great one. And he he is like defying everything we have come to know so far about this Olympic pool. It is not the greatest uh, from what everyone is saying in terms of just like the choppiness of it. It's a shallow mm -hmm. pool. So you're getting a lot of long lasting waves in the pool, which if you're a swimmer and you know, you hate that because it's adding just more pressure 
onto you from the sides. You can't stay uh, in an even streamline because you have so much wake and so many, you know, different waves coming at you. But Leon Marchand's like, yeah, this is my home pool. I'm going to dominate in it. Uh, absolutely crushed the 200 meter butterfly uh, and the 200 meter breaststroke. He's going to go for his fourth medal of the games in the 200 IM on Thursday. He's he's a he is a mutant. And I mean that respectfully, like the things he is doing in the pool at the age of 22 are paralleling what we saw Michael Phelps do for uh, the better part of a decade. Like it is fascinating watching how talented he is and just the, the pure like power along with finesse that he displays is so fun to watch. And if you haven't watched any of Leon Marchand yet in the pool, do yourself a favor and just like get your popcorn out and, and go watch him because he is such a, a bright spot of this year's Olympics. And the crazy part too is looking back to even in 2020 when he first qualified for his events, the the uprise and the meteoric rise has been so quick. In 2020, some of his some some of his numbers here, he placed sixth in the 400 meter individual medley, tenth in the four by one, fourteenth in the 200 meter butterfly, and eighteenth in the 200 meter individual medley. The fact that, and granted, he hasn't competed in any in any of these events yet, with the exception of the butterfly. To go from 14th in the butterfly at a 155 to gold at almost like what a, a buck 30, shaving 20 seconds off, granted in a four year period, but you're going from an 18 year old to a 22 year old. The mass has built up significantly. If you look at photos from 2020 to 2020 to 2024, he looks like a completely different person. Going um, from high school training to college training. With, of course, Michael Phelps' coach. I want to right. know. I, I want to know what his diet is. Is he, is he on the uh, the eighty thousand calorie Man. Michael Phelps diet that he's been on? At some if he point, is, like, he's shredded for it too. It's ridiculous. Like, I, like you look at this guy, and again, you, you look at the photos um, back and forth. He not only grew three inches, he also just looks like an absolute building. He looks like, and like we make the joke, Michael Phelps looks like a fish. This guy looks like a fish. Mm -hmm. Like it's actually freakish. And when. What awes me, particularly when he's doing the butterfly, and again, I I don't know a ton about swimming as a whole, but the way he glides, the it's the so water critical. almost looks like it's moving rhythmically with him. And in a situation like you're noting, the shallow pool, the choppy waves, he he just glides through it. He seems to make it his own. It's kind of like watching Moana, just to kind of kind, yeah. kind of surf through, do his thing. That I've seen that that a couple of times with a few with, with a few of these athletes, and it's just majestic. Um, to be able to see him do what he does, and he's only going to get better from here. I really want to see if he's able to um, encapsulate what Michael Phelps did over what a four year, a four Olympic span over um, sixteen years. I think he could very well do the same. Yeah, I mean, I, as a former butterfly, I was a hundred butterfly, not a two hundred butterfly. Again, two hundred butterfly is like a death sentence. Yeah. Um, but to like you said, like the the gliding motion that he has through the water and his ability to to stay buoyant as much as he does where he's not you know in butterfly if you lose your stroke you're finished more than any other stroke in my opinion because if you sink and you start ducking your head too far your entire body has to go under and then you're coming back up and it's it's like an up and down instead of just like staying at kind of a mendoza line almost mm -hmm. um and just seeing the way he moves and you know he wins the 200 butterfly by half a you know he goes 151.21. The next uh, finisher from Hungary, Christoph, goes 151.75. Like, to quantify that, and we talked about it a couple days ago when Nick Fink from the U.S., who I actually know, which is really cool to see him finish that tie for the silver medal in the breaststroke, the, the different reactions that you have throughout the course of a race can change your entire outcome when you finish by... 0.01 seconds whether oh, yeah. it's one extra kick underwater off your start uh you know the way you start if you slip off the block you know if you stay under for an extra kick if you come up too soon if you miss a, a wall on a turn unlike how you wanted to hit it like there's so many little minute things that can change the outcome of a race and i'm just looking at the reaction times as well uh from this 200 meter butterfly it's insane but Leon Marchand, like the top three, did not even have the fastest reaction times in this yeah. race. It was your fourth place finisher, uh, Kristoff from Poland, 
0.61 on the reaction time. Filthy. And your eighth place finisher, uh, Alberto from Italy, 0.62 reaction time. So again, like you can have that fast reaction time, still doesn't mean you're going to end up winning because there's so many other small details in the pool that can change the outcome of a race. But Leon Marchand is is so, so disgustingly talented. And if you haven't watched him yet, you're missing out. And if you missed out, we had the first world record that was set in the pool uh, was by a uh, Chinese swimmer. I want to pull up his name again because Hans on lay. Yes. Goes 46, 40 breaks the world record by 0.4 seconds. Nuts beats his competition by over a second in the hundred freestyle, which I, I genuinely don't even know how to like compare that. Like, you know, those tweets where it's like, explain this to me in NBA terms. I don't even know how to explain how insane that that is. And when you look at, you know, the finish between second place, who goes a 47-48, which is Chalmers from Australia, mm-hmm. and we had Jack Alexi from the U.S. in this event, too, finishes seventh at a 47-96. So a half a second separated second place and seventh place in this event. That's how fast the 100 freestyle is. And to go 46-40, decimate your competition all in world record fashion, kudos to you. 46-40 and, in the 100 freestyle is absurd. Now, the the even funnier part is, do you know whose record he broke? Oh, who was it? I forget. He broke his own. Oh, he actually, that's right. He actually swam a 4-6-8 uh, in February at the World Championships in Qatar. And in a seven-month span, manages to beat his record by, by, by 0.2. Which doesn't seem like a hell of a lot, but... You'd be shocked swimming at, at how much that, that at one stretch matters. A lifetime in swimming. Oh, yeah. Like force to go from a four six eight to a four a forty six point eight to a forty six point four is like it's almost like the difference of watching a, a TV show with and without commercials. That's the best Obscene. way I can put it. Like that's how much time that is shed in a point four seconds in a hundred freestyle. It's oh, nuts. Yeah. Um, but swimming has been electric, and I know it's one of those sports that not everyone watches year-round. I'm a sicko that I, I pay attention to it, especially in college, because it's just so fun watching collegiate swimming. But uh, how fun has this swimming Olympics been for you, Steve? I would so – I'm a big track guy. Uh, I follow track the most. I follow swimming the second most, largely because it is something that I can only watch four times a year. Um, I've, I'm also big into gymnastics. This swimming has been one of the best since, and even like not even talking for like j- just American standards, just to be able to watch the talent of, of, of everyone else. I mentioned this to a friend of mine. I'm like, the, this Olympics has probably been the most competitive amongst all of the nations collectively. I feel like in the past, a lot of it's been USA, Russia, and the kind of everybody else, but we're seeing Hungarians, we're seeing Swiss, we're seeing Estonians, we're seeing people um from across the european continent and then you you, you don't you don't even even have to look at something in particular you're looking at at, at any sport um in basketball I, I watched today south sudan kept the americans to a six point deficit through a half mm-hmm. the, the fact that that south sudan who who has nobody who's even sniffing a, a a nba basketball court right now is going up against lebron james kevin durant jason tatum and and edwards and holding them to the, a six point deficit at halftime it's pretty damn impressive. It's amazing to see uh, the strength of some of these nations as they progress uh, and find more and more athletes that are just absolutely superhuman. Yeah, and, and one last bit to the 200-meter uh, backstroke that Leon Marchand won. Australia took silver and the Netherlands. Casper uh, Corbeau, amazing name, uh, took bronze in the 200-meter backstroke. Uh, but yeah, with the, with the U.S. basketball team, uh, they get a, a win again against South Sudan. Um, what have, what's your takeaway of Dwayne Wade in the booth? It's, uh, it's good to be honest with you. I, I can't get enough of it because, um, I'm too busy with everything on mute. And so I can't really hear how things are going, uh, when I'm at work, but from what I've heard, it's, uh, it's been pretty strong. It's been okay. I have mixed reviews. He's been solid. Uh, like he has, like he hasn't like burst onto the scene, like Michael Phelps has in the booth and, and being, you know, obviously incredible. Uh, He's no Tony Romo. Right. 
<laughs> what I've enjoyed too, I don't know if you noticed from uh, if you've watched any of skateboarding, Ryan yeah. Sheckler made his debut in the booth and I thought he was fantastic. Like it's rare that you get the former athlete also being good in the booth. It, it's a difficult transition. I think yeah. Dwayne Wade for his first time being the Olympics is an interesting way to kind of throw him into the fire but I think he's doing a solid job. Like he's, he's a little over the top. He is kind of a little zany with some of the stuff he's saying, but he's fun. He's entertaining. And I, I like listening to Dwayne Wade talk. He's just a fascinating, uh, just human in general. And the fact that he's a, you know, basketball hall of famer is, is even better. Um, but I did find it interesting. Kyle Newbeck from PHLY, uh, sports tweeted this today, obviously, everyone's trying to take their jabs at Joel Embiid um, this Olympics. And it is a fascinating stat here that Kyle Newbeck put out um, with this Olympic team. The only players who finished in the negative against South Sudan in a 17 point win were LeBron James, Steph Curry, Anthony Davis, and Jason Tatum. Fascinating. And look, Jason Tatum should probably be getting more slaps, uh, should, should, should be getting more slaps in the hand than than Joel Embiid, considering the the absolute thrashing that he got, the DNP uh, in our first game. Steve Kerr was like, "We don't need this man." <laughs> and that was four out of your five starters today. The only other, the only starter who finished in the positive was Devin Booker. Yeah, the, no, the bench play came in huge. Kevin Durant, fourteen points, three steals. Uh, Bam leading All Americans at eighteen points and and lock, locking in seven boards. Uh, overall, th- like this, first of all. You ain't seen nothing yet when it comes to this um, basketball pool. The knockout stage is only around the corner. There has been some competition in the other groups, including even, honestly, in the American um, group. Like I said, South Sudan put, put up a fight. Serbia is, is no one to joke with. Of course, they have uh, two two of the goats of the sport right now. Um, Puerto Rico has been a bit a bit on the back burner. We'll see if they can, uh, can pull out one win in their final against America on Saturday. Steve Kerr is probably going to take things easy. But honestly, the rest of the group, the, the the teams that you probably haven't been watching for the uh, across from the American side, Canada, following a bronze medal from uh, from four years ago, is two and zero so far in group play. Uh, Australia and Spain are going to square off to see who to, who is the second team out of Group A, and then on Group B, Germany and France both both two and zero. Uh, the French really making a run without. I think this, this is the first Olympics without either a Tony Parker without Tony Parker or. Yeah, I think I, I, I actually without TP in the um on the team, of course, Wemby is uh is holding the Ford down. They're playing great so far. Uh, France and Germany, Brazil and Japan on Friday in the Group B. Uh, one thing to look out for that people are are forgetting. So it isn't just your standard top two teams for each group. The top two third place finishing teams also advance. Uh, so Group B is really interesting. Australia and Spain in that second spot are both currently tied at one and one. Odds are one of those teams will make it. Um, the other ones in the in the hunt, of course, Australia or Spain, and then of course Sudan and, and Serbia are the other two sides. Uh, unfortunately, Brazil and Japan are kind of on the back burner, both at 0 and 2 out in Group B. So we'll see how how that goes. The knockout stage is, is right around the corner. This is really kind of where the the Americans are going to get are going to start start to get tested. We're going to get a really 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 good competition and. Part of me is not very surprised if they find themselves playing a, a Spain or um, honestly a France for that matter and struggling very early on uh, might find themselves in a bit of a dogfight down the stretch. Going to have to see LeBron pull out a couple of uh, old tricks from the uh, from the old bag. Yeah, and just to touch on more basketball, I was watching a little bit of the three-on-three today. Um, it's fascinating that the U.S. doesn't have a single NBA player on their team. No, I and uh, when Jimmer Fredette is off the floor, they collapse. I like, first of all, and I don't know if this is a requirement within the three on three format. Um, but there are, and, and I, I don't mean to bash any Olympians, but you should be able to field a better three on three team, even on both sides, men and women, than no discredit to the WNBA players, but. The five-on-five team is so dominant comparative to the three-on-three. I know four years ago they had um, they had Cameron Brink on the roster. Of course, she's um, recovering from injury. They do have Haley uh, Haley Van Lith, of course, still in college uh, over at LSU. But I don't know. You, you're telling me you can't field even some girls who are on the five-on-five team.
can't come over to the three on three. I know it's a different kind of game. I think Kelsey Plum was on the three on three team um, a while back. So I I'm not a huge fan of these rosters. It's very underwhelming to to, to watch them compared to the five on five game. And it's like whether or not I, I heard someone compare it like, oh, it's like playing doubles in tennis. I'm like, yeah, but like it's three on three basketball. It's what you it's what you grew up playing in the backyard. But also sure, the fact different. that I know the names of the four women's players on the three on three team. Yeah. I don't know the men's. I know Jimmer Ferdet, and that's yeah. it. Like well, that's I, wild to me. Are the other three guys on the roster even um like former G uh G League players or like D League players or like do they have, have have any relevance? I know that, that that some of those guys have been on the um three on three teams in the past. At least the at least the the three on three women's team is all WNBA players, with the exception of of, uh, of Haley. Yeah, let me pull up their roster here. I also feel like if if they had put Caitlin Clark on, on one of these teams, it would have been a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Caitlin Clark running the point on, on the three on three would have been absolutely lethal. So the men's team is Canyon Barry. Yeah, the blonde guy, right? <laughs> yeah, Jimmer Fredette, uh, Kareem Maddox, and Dylan Travis. Yeah, I. No idea. No idea. I like, think it's... if you showed me those guys, even Jimmer, I wouldn't recognize them. Like, I know the name Ryan Howard. Obviously not baseball Ryan Howard, but I know Ryan Howard. I know Haley Van Lith. I know D'Erica Hamby. I know Sierra Burdick. Like, I know those names. And that's great for the women's sport, too. Like, the yeah. fact that me, a casual women's basketball fan, knows those four players. The fact that I just know Jimmer Fredette on the men's team is crazy. And you also don't even know Jimmer Fredette for the right reasons. The only reason why anybody knows who Jimmer Fredette is was from a, a little bit of a stinty NBA career was because he, he dropped, what, 100 points in high school and he was like averaging 40 points a game at BYU. And he's a Think star what? for the Shanghai Sharks. <laughs> so is Stefan Marbury in his age 47 season. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was that was wild to me that once Jimmer well, they absolutely crumble the the men's three on three team. So they still have some work to do. Um, but we got some cycling action, Steve. As Paris Benegas took silver in the women's BMX freestyle, uh, she won her first medal in her second Olympic appearance in the women's BMX freestyle final on Wednesday. She finished fourth in this event in Tokyo in 2023. She spent most of the year recovering from a leg injury, but came back to finish in second place at an Olympic qualifier series contest in June. American Hannah Roberts, the Tokyo silver medalist, finished eighth overall after falling in both runs. Hell of a comeback story. And that's what the Olympics are all about. Love to see it. Yeah, no, uh, a, a great turnaround. So, yeah, Paris takes silver for the U.S. Uh, Dang Yuen from China takes home gold. And Natalia Deem from Australia takes the bronze. Before we keep it pushing, though, I do want to talk to everybody listening and watching about our presenting sponsor for like the flame and Olympics podcast. And that's our friends over at Shopify helping bring you Olympics coverage from the underground all summer long. They are the number one global commerce and e-commerce brand out there. That green bag is one of the most iconic logos in the entire world. And Shopify started because they wanted to create a store to sell snowboards on their own. No commerce website was doing it for them. So they said, we're going to start our own. And now they are the global leader in commerce and e-commerce. Get your business booming and in the right direction with Shopify, whether you have a brick and mortar store or you're doing things online. And especially our friends who are YouTubers creating content on YouTube and you need store integration. If you're in the YouTube partner program, Shopify is the number one way to do it. Click the link in the description. Get your business booming with our friends at Shopify and thank us later because once you see the results, you're going to be in the green just like Shopify's green bag. Shout out to Shopify for helping bring our Olympics coverage to you all summer long. Steve, this is my favorite sport that I've discovered this Olympics and I can't wait to watch it in prime time tonight because the U.S. women's team has a medalist in it this year and that is women's canoe slalom. I love it. That, I am does it here compare for it. though? I I haven't watched any of it, but does it compare at all to the Winklevoss twins rowing crew and I or mining Bitcoin? I, I can't tell either. <laughs> I think it's more intense than the crew. <laughs> um, the way my brain is seeing it is like ski slalom, but from what I've been told, canoes. it's more like stationary with waves, and you're like going through everything. It's I in canoes. It. I can't wait to sit down and watch this. Evie Leibfarth wins the women's 
uh canoe slalom uh she earned bronze on wednesday she's from america it's the first uh no american male or female had won a canoe slalom medal since rebecca giddens won silver in k1 in 2004 which was the year that evie Leibfarth was born that's crazy um uh, i can't wait to sit down and watch she's 20 years old she never relinquished a podium spot throughout the race. Jessica Fox from Australia gets gold. Elena Lilik from Germany takes silver. This is my this is my Roman Empire. I have not been able to stop thinking about canoe slalom since I saw it was an official Olympic event when we were going through all the events, creating our lists for, for viewing and everything. I can't wait to sit and watch this because it looks absolutely electric. The, the only event that I am more intrigued by, and it's more because, like, I've always discounted it as one of those, like, events. You you hear about the decathlon and the heptathlon and the whatever it is. The modern pentathlon, basically, I, first of all, it, it, it's it's one of those events that honestly could have only been conjured up by a five-year-old with his imagination. Uh, the idea that you go from fencing to a 12-obstacle horse show where basically, first of all, you've never ever trained on these horses. It's just a horse. It's a random ass horse. Well, Follow fun my... fact: the horses for all the Olympic events, no matter what it is, the horse that that Olympian rides has to come from their home nation. That's crazy. I th that's actually very cool. And did you know the horses for the U.S. the way they travel? Our the name Sassafras. The plane is called Air Horse One. Anyways, it's not even a joke. It's real. I know. Fencing, a 12 obstacle horse ride with obstacles, a 200 meter freestyle and a 3000 meter run with four laser pistol galleries every 750 meters. Again, this is something that like, that, like I designed in my backyard when I was like, like playing with my imaginary friends at Ryan Reynolds. Like, it, like, like a, it's Mr. Beast creating video. squid game. Basically, yes. Except, except I, I'm not getting shot at if I uh, <laughs> if I screw up the event. Maybe, maybe in a different country, but they're banned from this Olympics. I, it, like, it, it's absolutely ludicrous to think the modern pentathlon exists, and I, it's like that's become my Roman Empire uh, this year. It's all I think about. It's all I'm curious about. Unfortunately, there's no American who's talented enough in it. Uh, but basically, if you can find yourself winning the modern pentathlon, you might as well sign up to be a Navy SEAL because uh, it's it, it is basically can you create a one man army? Yeah, standing That's on insane. business. The uh, the other sport, I I don't even know what it is, but they have like the I talked about it with Casey a little bit. They have like the cyberpunk outfits, and they have these like mini little pistols that they're shooting. I don't even know what the sport is, but it's it's so fascinating watching these people in these outfits. Just like it's like precision shooting or something. I love it. And I'm they look little... they look like Junie from Spy Kids because they have like these eye things to like laser in on where they're trying to shoot it to. Like they look like out of out of like Cyberpunk 2099 or something. First of all, 2077. It's, it's it's evolving. It's 2099 now. I think what's also really cool uh is is the fact that they're they're implementing breakdancing. I mean, I know every single uh, Olympics they add on new events, of course, in 28 in LA, uh they're gonna have, of course, lacrosse, baseball back. The one sport that I actually mentioned to some friends that, that they should implement in L.A., uh, they should send people to the mountains of Oregon and do, like, wood cutting. Log rolling, team Log hand rolling saw. would be sick. Like, you could do some really cool shit out in Oregon. That would be absolutely hilarious. That would be fire. Um, yeah, I'm about that. I'm down with that. Uh, <laughs> have you ever seen those like on on ESPN, oh yeah at the ocho it's like the the guys who like like chop into the side of the tree put the plank jump on the log and, and keep going yeah it's called a so tree good. felling so uh good. i can watch that thing all day um men's gymnastics continued today as we had uh paul judah and freddie flips frederick richard from the u.s uh, but Shinosuke Oka of Japan won the men's gymnastics all-around final. Japan is now the first country ever to win four consecutive all-around titles. The top, uh, two top spots in men's all-around podium were expected to be Zhang Bang and Daiki Hashimoto. Instead, Oka won gold while Hashimoto finished in sixth. Paul Judah and Frederick Richard, Freddie Flips, finished 14th and 15th place respectively. 
Richard was the 2023 all-around world bronze medalist, but a fall on the pommel horse combined with small mistakes throughout held him back. Uh, Japan takes gold. China takes silver and bronze there. And uh, the U.S. women's national team, the soccer, even in a new era, they're still perfect in Paris. 2-1 win over Australia on Wednesday to close out group play. Trinity Rodman was first to react to a redirected ball from Sophia Smith to put the ball in the back of the net. Lengthy VAR check goal was given to the U.S. Corbin Albert uh, booted the ball outside the box. Shout out to our lacrosse podcast. Finding the top left corner in the 77th minute as a substitute. The U.S. had already secured a spot in the quarterfinals before Wednesday's match, but they faced Japan in the quarterfinals on Saturday. They're just nasty, man. Like they're no matter what they do, like they they've had so much turnover this year in particular from years past, and they are still continuing to dominate. You know, but both men and women are uh, are putting on a show. Of course, not the the men's side at least isn't isn't the true national team that you are used to with their U twenty three team. But um, they're also playing Morocco in the quarterfinal uh, the day before on Saturday the second. Uh, so we'll I'm looking forward to a nice nine a.m. fixture on both uh, Saturday and Sunday for that one. That's going to be great. Fun fact here, too. On day five of competition, the U.S. won four medals, increasing their total count to 30. Uh, Team USA's Wednesday medals were earned like the by the aforementioned Paris Benegas, uh, who won the silver in BMX freestyle, Evie Leibfarth, who won uh, bronze in the canoe slalom, Tori Husk, who got silver in swimming, and obviously Katie Ledecky, the gold in swimming. Of the 30 total medals won by the U.S. so far in this Olympics, 19 of those medals have been earned by American women. Very cool. Love That's to see awesome. that. Also, by the way, uh, the USA, which I think is like, it, it's crazy, not only the delegation that they send, but also j- just the overall competence of the athletes compared to, c- compared to the field, uh, yesterday earned their 3,000th medal. No country in the world has surpassed 1,500. That's nuts absolutely ridiculous and this is only in the modern olympics if you go all the way back to the beginning of time uh the the numbers are a little smaller but the usa existing only from 1776 is still ahead of everybody else and we boycotted a couple olympics yeah they have indeed and also took a few took a few off because of the war or the wars so to, to put that into perspective uh, particularly o- over the modern years from from not from 18, 1896 to now, absolutely filthy. The you know speaking of the U.S. too, they get a huge upset in men's doubles in tennis. Oh my God! They took I, down the doll and Alcaraz today, Steve. What a treat to be able to watch something like that. There's been I I, I said it to my friends. I'm like the fact that the Spanish could put up Carlos Alcaraz and Rafa Nadal, and I understand. Playing doubles when you're predominantly a singles player is very challenging. That's still a cheat code of a team. I think, uh, like I saw, Great Britain was playing Andy Murray. This is his last ever um, competition. He's he's officially retired from men's tennis overall, and he's retiring t- uh, after this Olympics. Uh, I saw a bunch of a uh, bunch, bunch of older names competing. I'm like Alcaraz, the 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 now young stud, the one of the greatest uh, national men. And then, of course, Rafa Nadal, one of the two goats of the sport, is was was an absolute cheap uh, cheat code. But unfortunately, well, unfortunately for for us, but lost to a pair of Americanos. Yeah, uh, big upset. Rajiv Ram and Austin Krajcik win six two six four straight sets, baby. That's what we love to say against like the it boy in Alcaraz and the legend in the doll. I, my jaw dropped when I realized that they took them and that's no slight to them. It's just like when you see two Titans of the sport like that, both new and old, you expect the dominance to continue. And it's like one of those things with Nadal, kind of like Andy Murray, like it's kind of the swan song in the Olympics for Nadal this year. Mm-hmm. You, you think the storybook ending could potentially happen. And then boom, the, the upset underdog Americans come through and take down Spain in doubles. I was blown away by the dominance there by America. However, I will say, um, despite the fact that the Americans were able to knock them off, uh, should be a challenge tomorrow, 6 a.m., uh, Carlos Alcaraz goes up against another American, Tommy Paul, in the men's singles quarterfinal. That uh, should certainly be 
Alcaraz's way of, uh, of getting back into things. I don't know how the, the bracket kind of lines up, but if we end up getting a joke of it, uh, a Novak Djokovic versus Alcaraz final in the Olympics. Let me actually see how the, that uh, would be insane. how the bracket looks. Let's see. Uh, The one thing that I, I I want to discredit the Olympics on is that they made it incredibly hard to like view everything very easily. Yeah, it's very challenging to 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 like view some of the stuff. Um, let's see. Oh my goodness, I cannot find literally anything. Uh, so I will hopefully find that for you soon. But yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, while we looked that up, in case you missed it, uh, from today's action on Wednesday, July 31st, Brazil's Marta, a six-time FIFA World Player of the Year and perhaps the most celebrated player in women's soccer history, received a red card versus Spain in what could end up being her last appearance in a Brazil kit at a major competition. Not, I have not been a fan of the referees in some of these sports kind of becoming a spotlight in a lot of instances granted i did not see what exactly happened there uh and obviously it's a red card so that's a little bit more major than what you would see from a yellow card but nonetheless mm -hmm. disappointing for uh for marta who is just an absolute legend by the way i can uh result that the quarterfinals djokovic versus stefanos sisipas uh likely that that novak the number one seed will win uh, he will play the winner of Alexander Zverev and Lorenzo Musetti. And then on the other side, Tommy Paul and Carlos Alcaraz against Ka uh, against the winner of Casper Rudd and Felix Auger Alassime from Canada. So we very much can see a Novak Djokovic, Carlos Alcaraz final. Man, if that happens, get your popcorn ready. And the only best part of that is that a week and a half from then, they're going to be right here in Queens, but by me, probably taking on the men's final too. Uh, at Arthur Ashe. So the, whoever wins the Olympics, you're going to see a very fired up person uh, in New York for the U.S. Open. It's going to be awesome. Uh, the U.S. women's volleyball team survived a strong comeback by Serbia. They ended up winning three to two. Uh, so congrats to the ladies uh, from volleyball. The U.S. beach volleyball team of Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes defeated France in two sets to earn their second victory in pool play. Um few notable track and field updates ahead of competition beginning on Thursday. Sherika Jackson of Jamaica dropped the 100 meter and will only run the 200 meter at the Olympics. Uh, Sifan Hassan of the Netherlands confirmed her Olympic program in Paris, which includes the 5,000 meter, the 10,000 meter, and the marathon. God, Whew. you hate yourself? That's horrible. My, my knees hurt just reading that. Uh, Czechoslovakia's Emil Zatopek is the only athlete, male or female, to win medals in the 5,000 meter, 10,000 meter, and marathon at a single Olympics. So could potentially be looking at some history there uh, for Hassan if she ends up uh, doing the dang thing there in those events. Uh, the U.S. women's water polo team, shout out to Flavor Flav, uh, held Italy to just three goals in a 10-3 victory. I don't know if you saw the story, Steve. If they end up winning gold, Flavor Flav said the entire team's getting clock necklaces. I would I would riot. That'd be hilarious. Uh, and like we mentioned earlier, uh, the U.S. defeated South Sudan 103-86 in group play. LeBron James now joins Kevin Durant and Carmelo Anthony as the only U.S. men's basketball players to score 300 Olympic points. Absolutely crazy. And the surfing event in Tahiti remains postponed. The next call will be made uh, at 11.45 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday. Probably the most head-scratching part of the Olympics so far is the fact that they not only have... So I, I know that there are some athletes staying on the island of Tahiti, but they're surfing right above one of the most dangerous coral reefs in the world. Something doesn't sound like a very smart decision when they chose their... Uh, their landing spot for where they're going to be surfing. So just a thought, yeah, just thought. Um, but before we get into what's going down uh, tomorrow, I do want to give the floor to Steve because the big event is his wheelhouse and that's Olympic golf. And if you guys missed it, uh, check out the most recent episode of the getting the whole podcast. It'll be linked in the description, big old Olympic golf preview 
for everybody in detail. But Steve, how excited are you for Olympic golf in France? It's going to be awesome. Uh, the men tee it up tomorrow morning as we record here on a Wednesday night. So Thursday morning, they will uh, tee it up. Short 60-man field uh, this week as well. The women will tee it up next week, playing at Le Golf National in Paris, France, of course. Uh, I'm hyped for it. It's going to be awesome. I love that there's a love and hate relationship with Olympic golf. Uh, I love the fact that it's for everybody competing, whether you're American, Korean, Spanish, English, whatever it might be. Um, the nationalist pride runs way deeper in, in situations like this than you see even at like Ryder Cups and President's Cups, where, of course, the Ryder Cup, Team Europe, they love this event. The Americans it, they were they were as a badge of honor. Uh, Matthew Pavan, who was who was re re representing his native France, said that a win at the Olympics would probably be the greatest achievement of his life, uh, better than any Ryder Cup he'd ever qualify for, better than any major he'd ever win. It's the Olympics in Paris. It's what he has been training for his entire life. Uh, actually, won the Farmers Insurance Open earlier this year, so uh, his first win on on, on tour is uh, is big leading up to an event like this. But I'm very excited for it. Uh, men teed up Thursday. We're women teed up, I believe, on the sixth next week. It's going to be uh, it's going to be quite intense. There's, despite the short field, there's going to be a lot uh, of really good golf to be played uh, across the sixty players in the field. And I know you guys touched on it on the episode, but I didn't get a chance to fully dive into it. There's only seven live golf uh, members. Yeah. So, so the 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 IOC or or the IGF in this case, the International Golf Federation. Uh, base their selections for countries based on uh, the official World Golf rankings, which for those of you who are unaware of it, uh, kind of slight live golfers a little bit uh, because they don't they don't technically get points for competing in their own events. So they only can get points from majors. Uh, so the only seven that were able to qualify this week for the event uh, were guys who basically have joined late uh, into live over the last say year uh, and haven't logged enough time to have fallen off the um, the track that heavily. So, for example, right, you look at, like, Team America. Of course, they're sending four delegates, the only country um, that will have four. Because based on the OWGR, there are, I think, I believe seven Americans in the top ten. So uh, they have the largest number. The top 15 automatically qualify, and then it's the top two from every other country that will qualify. Um, Bryson DeChambeau should very well be in the field this week, but he is not. Uh, therefore, Wyndham Clark, because he's the highest on point totals within the American slate, will get it. Uh, John Rahm will make the field, of course, uh, representing Spain, but also as a live golfer. Reason being is because he has not logged enough time on live to have fallen off. Uh, he's, I believe, I think a top to sell 20 player in the world. Um, so few similar names that, that, of course, when the Olympus came back in 2016 to Rio, uh, some names that you won't be seeing, like Sergio Garcia representing uh, Spain, Louis Ustazen uh, representing South Africa. Some of those guys will not be in the field this week. But Joaquin Neiman, Mito Pereira, both teaming up for Team Chile, uh, as well as Carlos Ortiz and Abraham Answer for Team Mexico, to name a few. And I know you guys also discussed whether or not it should be match play or stroke play in the Olympics. Yeah, so, the, so the, this is kind of where I, I, I mentioned the, the love-hate about Olympic golf. So it's a four-day stroke play event, both on the men's and women's side. I don't personally like it. I also think the field should be larger than only 60, uh, 60 players. I actually found out, and I made a mistake on the show, the reason why uh, Bobby McIntyre of Scotland is not participating in the event is because technically, according to the Olympics, Great Britain is, not, is the team, not England. So therefore, the Welsh and the Scots are not – they would have to play under the Great Britain flag, and the three nations disagree on that. Therefore – Scottish and Welsh players are not included in the field, which is also why th there's no team Great Britain uh, in Olympic soccer, because realistically it's England, Scotland, and Wales. So that's why Bobby McIntyre will not be in the field uh, this week, and also why the English are only sending two delegates and not four, uh, because most of the other English players uh, don't want to play under the Great Britain flag. They want to play under the English flag. So it's a pretty interesting mix. Uh, on top of that, there are other countries. The that aren't included in this Olympics. A lot of guys uh, are taking time off because they're getting ready for the playoffs that, that start up in only two weeks from now. Uh, so unfortunately, the field's a little bit short, so they kind of have to go with a stroke play here. But um, my wish is that they go to 144-man field and do similar what they do to the uh, at amateur tournaments. Two days, cut, 
And then from there, the top 64 players play a match play over the final two days um, bracket style to determine who is the winner of the Olympics, which I, I think would be awesome. Uh, the stroke play is a little bit too underwhelming, particularly if you're going to have one bad day and all of a sudden you're kind of out of it, um, which is just how it is in golf. And you, need, you, really, you really need to bring your A game uh, at a golf course like this out in Paris. Um, it's no slouch, 7,200 yards. It's a mixed POA and bent grass green, so it's not, not, not typically what you see on PGA Tour circles by any means. Um, but it should be a challenge nonetheless for all 60 guys in the field. And for everybody at home who may just be a casual or don't pay attention to golf, can you uh, give us the differentiation between stroke play and match play? Just so, yeah, so the kind of wrap their heads around that. So the stroke play is you're you're playing for the lowest possible score per day. So 20 under par, let's say the par 71 golf course. So 20 under par would be, um, let's say you averaged five under, six under, whatever that, that number is. So if it's 20 under, if you were the winner, that would be the score. Match play would be a individual one-on-one. Uh, you would play your 18 holes, and you would see who um, who logs par or better on each hole. Lowest score for each hole wins, and you can obviously win um, earlier than the 18 holes. I was depending on uh, on how, how things play out, which is again the way I would prefer it to be. But um, stroke Feels play like it makes more to, sense for the Olympics. You would think, uh, but unfortunately, it's it's incredibly challenging to have a a large scale field compete in a four day match play because uh, some guys will also be playing like 36 holes in a day. Uh, it, this case would be easy with only a 60-man field. You could easily do it, um, and you can actually spread it out pretty well over four days. But I also think it's unfair to everybody um, that we don't have a lot more golfers in the field and more delegates being sent from countries like Spain, England, France, uh, Mexico, Canada, just name a few. Um, so what are, you, what are you looking forward to in terms of, you know, player approach who's going to succeed on this course who who best whose game best fits and uh who could be walking away with with some hardware so four years ago xander shoffley won in tokyo uh american actually american swept the golf event uh nelly corda the number one player in the world now currently also in the field for the women's side they the american swept swept the gold and i o- believe almost took the silver as well uh four years ago a little bit, a little bit of background on this golf course, which I think is going to make things really compelling. So actually, uh, Le Golf National uh, hosted the Ryder Cup in 2018, so Team USA versus Team Europe. Um, Xander Shoffley was on that team. Colin Morikawa for America was not, nor Xander Shoffley or Wyndham Clark. Uh, Tommy Fleetwood, who, for those of you who do watch Get in the Hole, uh, you know that I beat the dead horse every single week and want this guy to win, but he never actually does. Uh, actually was the leading point scorer for Team Europe. Uh, at this golf course, he scored four points back in 2018. Uh, actually, when asked in an interview today how the rough uh, would feel, Rory McIlroy said, you should ask the Americans. I wasn't in it much in 2018. Uh, they dominated the U.S. 17.5 to 10.5 point-wise uh, there. So this golf course has also hosted the yearly French Open. So a lot of the guys who play on, on the DP World Tour, the European circuit, uh, are going to be very familiar with this golf course as opposed to those who play on the PGA Tour, which is about a half and half split um, for the field this week. Who is the most well fit for this course? There's a lot of key stats that kind of go into figuring out my every single week approach on, on who is the best players here. Um, it's a quote unquote Florida style golf course. So they, they, they designed it with the intent of making it more of a, uh, a pinpoint accuracy course, like, like the ones you see on the PGA Tour down in Florida. So good driving is going to be a really big deal. Uh, Don't be erratic. You want to hit it straight. You want to hit it um, far. It doesn't necessarily matter. So you can be a little bit shorter uh, and have success. 7,200 yards is about an average golf course um, on PGA Tour standards. So you don't need to be the longest hitter. You don't have to be the uh, the shortest hitter. You could dominate uh, in your own ways. But keeping the ball straight and narrow is going to be really important. These are very narrow uh, fairways approach play every single week from about 150 yards in those low to mid irons are going to be huge as they are every single week. It's probably the one stat that probably makes the most sense um, for every single golf course. If you can hit the ball close to the hole, then you usually will get it in uh, and score better. Um, there's not a lot of opportunities to hit driver on, on this golf course. So you will see guys who are hitting woods, uh, hitting irons into greens. I think Justin Thomas uh, in 2018 basically hit, I think, only four drives in his four rounds at the Ryder Cup. So to give you an idea of, of how, again, you don't even need to hit it hit it that far. You really do need to hit it straight. Um, and the lower the club you go for the for you casuals, uh, the more accurate you tend to be. 
And then, of course, um, strokes game putting is going to be the key um, to winning here. Keep a straight drive, hit an accurate shot, be the win, be the win in twenty feet of the hole. And if you putt well, you should win. Uh, and then, a pro, and then around the green is going to be crucial. With that being said, I think there's three names that pop off the sheet for me. Um, first of all, Tommy Fleetwood, who like like I mentioned, playing for Team England, four points here at the 2018 Ryder Cup, won the 2017 French Open at this golf course, has been absolutely incredible on the DP World Tour his entire career. To give you reference, he has eight DP World Tour career wins and I believe like 300 appearances. He's played over 200 events on the PGA Tour and has yet to win in America. So to kind of give you that idea, he is dialed in when he's back home in Europe playing in similar conditions to what he's used to in England, playing in France right here on the water in Paris. He's going to do totally fine. I think he is he's in line um, for medal contention. Um, the Swede, Alex Norin, Probably can't find anybody who has been the most consistent golfer uh, on tour this year. Um, he has finished in the top 25 and 12 of his 18 starts this year, including three of those in the top 10, most of which coming over the last six and a half weeks, which has been amazing. Uh, he played in the 2020 Olympics. He finished T16. Uh, he was a member of the 2018 Ryder Cup. He went two and one in, in his three matches, actually beat Bryson DeChambeau in a singles match. Uh, he's 41 years old. He won here in 2018 too. He understands what he what needs to happen in order to win. He's 13th in the field this week in short and approach and 11th in good driving percentage. Uh, he's also been a fantastic putter on these uh, bent grass power greens. Guys who putt well on certain greens tend to have an advantage. In this case, um, Alex Noren is a, a mastermind there. Uh, turning over to the Americans, so the, the popular pick is going to be Xander Schauffele to repeat after a four-year layover, or even Scotty Scheffler, who... Those of you who have watched golf has been by far the great, the best golfer in the world uh, this year. He has six wins. He's been on an absolute tangent, but at the same time, hasn't necessarily had a lot of late season success. Um, and the Olympics is no um, is no different to anything in terms of form. My guy, who, who I want to highlight that I think is going to be a real big um, go getter this week is actually Colin Morikawa. Again, very much like I had mentioned with Alex Noren and Tommy Fleetwood, very accurate. Doesn't hit it very erratic. His approach play is number one in the field, also number one on tour this year. His putting has been great. He's really good on those bent grass greens. This is one of those golf courses where someone like Colin Morikawa fits the bill to a T, and I use this term uh, often on the show, horses for courses. It just works. Like you put someone in a spot that they're used to doing things, and they will naturally progress well. Um, this year has been a little bit frustrating for Colin. He's been one of the best, best players in the world, but he just can't seem to finish. He hasn't registered a win yet. Um, despite that, he's shined the brightest in the biggest moments. He finished third at the Masters, fourth at the PGA, second at the Memorial, which is one of the other big-time um, regular season tournaments, 14th at the U.S. Open, and he finished 16th at the Open, which occurred in Scotland just two weeks ago. He's also won at the Open Championship, so he's used to European conditioning golf courses. I think with the way the course is set up, I think Colin Morikawa should be your gold medal winner this week. And then obviously I think everyone uh, will be intrigued. And you and I have talked about this on Getting the Hole. You and Ben have talked about it on Getting the Hole. Uh, where where do you think the Olympics kind of plays for America's bad boy, Scotty Scheffler? Uh, you know, it, it's in that weird part of the schedule where it's not yeah. in his, his peak performance. Uh, and obviously it's a, a different course from what is the norm on the PGA Tour. So where do you think uh, Mr. Bad Boy himself, Scotty Scheffler, is going to uh, wind up? Uh, I don't think he'll medal. I think the medal, my medals as of right now, it's going to be Xander with the bronze, Scotty, uh, sorry, Tommy Fleetwood with the silver, and Colin with the gold. Um, those guys in the top five, I think Scotty Scheffler on skill alone can get there. Uh, but I just don't think that, with his erratic play sometimes, the guy can hit the ball a country mile, but sometimes it isn't the most accurate off the tee. Otherwise, everything else from 150 in, he's been terrific. Uh, it's really going to come down to the driver for me. I think he'll finish probably top five, but I just I think he won't have enough. It's going to take a lot of a it's going to take a lot more of a putting performance for him than anything else uh, to gain strokes on the field in order to get up there. But with the field that you have, there's so many good putters, uh, and there's so many guys who hit the ball just straighter than him that I think can give him fits. It's going to be fascinating to watch it all go down. And obviously the women are playing as well. Steve and we were talking before we started recording. It, it really comes down to uh, who's going to be able to compete with Nelly Corda. 
honestly, I think the the LPGA field and the the, the ladies field in this event is probably even better than the men's uh, because there's just so many more top tier talent that's that's competing. The the OWGR exists obviously um, with Live Golf. There's no live version for the women. So you are literally getting the top 60 best players in the world for the women's side. Brooke Henderson from Canada, uh, a bunch of the ladies out in Japan and, and Korea, uh, in Bay Park, who has been fantastic this year. Um, Lydia Ko from Australia, Nelly Korda and Lillian Vu, both from America, probably the two front runners this week as two of the top three players in the world. Uh, don't know enough about how Nelly's been playing this year. I do know she's been playing quite well, but Lillian Vu has been a little bit better. Uh, I'm curious to see what happens, but if I have to give an educated guess from my, for, for my medals, I like Ko, Vu, and Korda in no particular order. It's going to be interesting. Uh, definitely check out the Big Giant Olympic Golf Preview episode. It's linked in the description uh, of the Get in the Hole podcast. And uh, Steve, tomorrow, along with golf, we have another awesome slate of olympic sports and it all gets started uh at 1 30 a.m eastern time with athletics the men's 20 kilometer race walk <laughs> i love that shit that's uh, great we also have women's doubles and men's singles for badminton three on three basketball and beach volleyball continue we've got women's handball group play we've got more pistol shooting for pre-event training both men and women uh, skeet shooting as well. And then we have uh, the women's 20 kilometer race walk going down as well. Uh, we've got men's individual archery. We've got rowing getting underway. We've got rifle shooting, uh, more beach volleyball, field hockey, judo, table tennis continues. Anthony Edwards is probably going to be locked in his new favorite sport. Um, more rowing goes down as we have a medal event for the women's double skulls final water polo group play continues on the u.s taking on greece in group a pool play uh we also have boxing which up until yesterday i didn't even realize was in the olympics this year Elite. but amazing stuff we've got equestrian the jumping team qualifier uh and my favorite tweet rolling around uh right now is do the horses in the Olympics get medals. And from what I've seen, I don't believe the horses do, which I think is complete and utter bullshit. They're the athletes. Yeah. It's awesome, champ. Actually what they should get. And this is the one thing that I want to close with before we, uh, before we get out of here. Um, I don't know if you know this, but in the Olympic village, every single uh, competitor gets a pin that's related to their country and their sport. I think the horses, those who win should get the, the, uh, the exclusive Snoop Dogg pin. Yep. That. Yep. That's just absolutely amazing. Yep, Coco they, Golf got that one. Yeah, uh, actually from uh, from Golf, I saw this photo from online. Yeah, that's a uh, probably the coolest pin of all time. I, I I love how some of these athletes will like make their own designer pins. Like like Simone Biles apparently ha has her own like line, and like she gives them out to other like people who she meets. Apparently, it's like a big thing to get mm -hmm. Simone Biles pin. Uh, it's, it, it's it's fueling, the Olympic equivalent to the friendship bracelet. It it's fueling my fiance's like inner Disney child when they used to <laughs> like, like, like always sell pins. That's that's like the thing, and I love it. Uh, also, shout out to Alana Mar, uh, Quinnipiac graduate, bronze medalist in the in the women's rugby. Also, a hilarious uh, social media presence. Shout out to the Bobcats. We not we not only have a Stanley Cup winner, we have a national championship hockey team and a freaking Olympian, uh, uh, Olympian medalist. Might we I also ask. have a, a medalist on that same rugby team from Philadelphia, Ari Ramsey, uh, from Upper Marion on the squad. She also uh, is Team Wawa, so shout out to Wawa there. Wawa. And it's just perfect because the rugby team is calling themselves the, the Eagles. So she's a true Philadelphia Eagle. Um, I love great it. stuff there. Uh, we also have men's windsurfing potentially continuing tomorrow. I don't know if that's been impacted like surfing has, but it has, yeah. Um, hopefully that gets underway. We've also got more tennis, more swimming. The 50 meter freestyle heats are going on. Talk about speed. You got speed there, and Caleb Dressel Prince, will be in those bad boys as well. Um, it's going to be a loaded slate, a lot of fun stuff going down on Thursday. And Steve, we've got the Olympic medal count to round out the show. It's brought to you by our pals over at FOCO. 
the leaders in forever collectibles. They've got their Team USA capsule available for pre-order. You get your Team USA tumbler mug, coffee mug. Who doesn't love a little garden gnome with Team USA on it as well? They've also got those stuffed bears that you've come to know and love over the years with Team USA monikers on them. Plus, FOCO has you covered with all your favorite sports teams in the NHL, NFL, MLB, NBA, WWE, college basketball and football, all officially licensed across the board. Click the link in the description and go support FOCO and get your Team USA collectibles added to your collection today. And shout out to FOCO for sponsoring the pod. Uh, leading the way, Steve, in the gold medal count is China. They have nine golds so far, 19 overall medals. The home nation of France with eight golds and 26 overall medals. And then Japan in third place with eight golds as well, but only 15 overall medals. Team USA still leading the overall medal count with 30. They have five gold, 13 silver, and 12 bronze. Uh, a couple days ago, DJ and I were recording an episode, and there's some countries that are just fun to see like in the standings and that have medaled that you traditionally don't feel like they'd be like towards the top of the standings, but you know, to see Hong Kong, you know, in the mix in the top 15, you have the, you have Georgia, not Atlanta, Georgia, but you have Georgia, uh, in the top 15 as well. Kazakhstan's been hanging around the top 20. Very nice. Very nice. That's a very nice. Very impressive. Uh, South Africa is, is sticking around there in the top 20 as well. Guatemala gets a medal today they got their first gold i believe uh they are tied for 19th with croatia azerbaijan in the top 25 uzbekistan in the top 25 um and then there's also countries that you feel like they'd be a little higher up in the standings than they traditionally are you feel like mexico would be closer to the top 20 than being below the top 30. They have they are tied for 32nd in medals. Spain hasn't really gotten going yet either. They traditionally feel like a summer Olympic powerhouse. They only have one medal to their name. Greece only with one medal. Um, so there's some nations that you feel like would be a little bit higher in the rankings, but obviously still a little more than a week and a half to go in competition. Some events still haven't even gotten going, but... Don't be concerned that America is not in the top three. They are a second half nation when it comes to winning medals. The team events is, is where it matters most. I also want to give a shout out uh, to my native uh, Irish, Daniel Viffen, Viffen, not Wiffen, uh, the first ever swimming gold medalist in Ireland history in the men's 800 freestyle uh, yesterday. So congratulations to Daniel on a terrific uh, run. It's their only, it's their only gold medal. And it is their first gold medal. Um, sorry, only the, only their third gold medal since dating back to, 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 to 1996. Wow. Crazy. Uh, Casey and I touched on this. We'll end with this story. We touched on Italy's historic uh, silver medal in women's gymnastics. It was the first time since, I believe, 1904 that they hit the podium in women's uh, gymnastics. And... The story that's rocking the internet today is the ambassador partnership of the century for Italian gymnast star Georgia Villa has an ambassador deal with Parmigiano Reggiano. Yes. By the way, that's the my cheese. go-to cheese company. The cheese. I, um, like, like, I want to put it out there. No free ads. That is the cheese brand that my grandma has been buying since I was six years old. And when I go to the supermarket, I tell Kay, this is what we're getting. We're not getting that, that like Bellagioso shit. We're not getting that store brand stuff. We are getting the good stuff. Uh, I love it. It has taken the internet by storm. And I said, I got to do some more deep digging on this because this is the most obscure, unique, and fascinating brand deal I have ever seen. Uh, so she wins the silver medal. She's also an ambassador for Parmigiano Reggiano. Uh, and the the quote in terms of like tying sport with the cheese brand coming from uh, the marketing agency Impresa e Sport. Uh, here's, here's the quote that got me rolling and even more into the weeds on this. The combination of Parmigiano Reggiano and the world of sport is indissoluble in terms of authenticity, quality 
and energetic value both in sporting activity and in correct nutrition. I've never seen a better marketing word scramble than this. The other fascinating thing is, you know, it's obviously taken the internet by storm today and yesterday, but Via has been an ambassador for Parmigiano Reggiano since April of 2021. And I did some digging on this. She's not the only athlete that is an ambassador for the cheese company. Uh, she is also uh, part of Team Team Parma with uh, young world tennis talent Janik Sinner, rising star of American basketball Nico Mannion, and the fencer from Bologna Matteo Neri, and Paralympic swimmer from Parma Julia Garetti. She's also delivered. Like, you want to have the face of cheese be on the world stage. She's won 10 medals between the Olympics, the World Championships, the European Championships, the Mediterranean Games, and the Youth Olympics. I, I, I don't want to make too many puns, but first of all, she's been a monster out there. She's a very Gouda, and uh, you better believe it. And she's bringing home the cheddar, baby. <laughs> Shout out to uh, Sarah Sarah Kazele, uh, or, or, or Kazili. Um, for NBC, literally wrote an article with the headline, Italian gymnast Georgia Via, sponsored by Cheese, question mark? You feta believe it. She she has literally put a a, a pun in every single thing. Um, absolutely ridiculous. As, as her name made the rounds with Olympic viewers, one fan barata up a well-aged sponsorship deal of Via's and put and put up, put up the tweet. The, like, the... The puns on here are actually ridiculous. And there's an entire photo story uh, by the photographer. I believe it's uh, Gabrielle Zaghizi. Uh, he's a photographer for Red Bull um, and all of their like action sports and everything, but did an entire photo story on this. I'll link his website and the story in the description for everybody. It's unreal, like his breakdown of what Parmigiano Reggiano wanted to him to do for the story and everything um it's amazing it, they they call it a testimonial um has always played a key role in the communication of a brand its role is to transfer its positive characteristics directly to the product a transfer of value and credibility that has the power to convince and sometimes to change the opinion of the final user the character becomes the guaranator of the brand value uh, and he was tasked to do a whole like portrait shoot of her with the cheese just in action. And you've seen some of the photos, but there's a whole lot more on the website. He's got a ton of stories of different athletes on his website as well. So I'll link that in the description. That's where all these viral photos of her with the, the wheels of cheese have come from is, uh, is from that photographer. So a fascinating story. I'm sure it won't be the final fascinating story we get from these Olympic games as they continue on, but uh, we hope everybody has been enjoying the 2024 Paris Olympic Games so far. Steve, I'm sure you'll be hopping back on once track and field gets underway to talk about oh, yeah. golf as well. Um, but be sure to follow us on social media on Twitter at LTF Olympics and then on Instagram and threads at Light the Flame Pod. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast, Apple and Spotify in particular. It's crazy. I've been watching the numbers, Steve. We've gotten so many subscribers on this show, and it's barely, you know, a couple weeks old. Um, not even a week old yet in terms of episodes. So thank you to everybody that has subscribed, that's been downloading and listening. Keep on doing it. Share it with your friends. And then the video versions of all the episodes are on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash at underground sports Philadelphia. Keep subscribing over there as well. We're 80 subscribers away from 900. Let's get to that platform uh, plateau pretty soon and then hopefully on to 1,000 and then some. Uh, but keep on subscribing. Keep enjoying the Olympic Games. And this has been Light the Flame, an Olympics podcast for Wednesday, July 31st. Steve, your final thought. As they say in Marvel movies, I will be back and I will be back exclusively to, to discuss this. <laughs> Stephen McAvoy will return. Don't you worry. But this has been Light the Flame, an Olympics podcast for Wednesday, July 31st. Everybody enjoy primetime, and we'll see you back here tomorrow for another episode.